Well, good evening and welcome to Wednesday of the Word, the weekly online study of the Bible hosted by Lebanon Rock Church. I'm Pastor Matt Skiles, and we welcome you to our study for this Wednesday evening, April the 6th, 2022. We are continuing our current lesson series from the book of Hebrews with the theme of Let Us Go On to Perfection in Jesus Christ. And we are going to be looking at lesson number 10 tonight, which is going to be out of Hebrews chapter 11, and it's titled Faith, the Greatest Power in the world. So as always, I encourage you to make sure that you have brought your Bible with you, your tablet, your smartphone, uh, whatever your Bible app is that you're using this evening is going to be more than helpful and is going to be more than useful for this evening's study. And of course, if you brought something to drink, I have brought my cup of coffee and uh, have my St. Louis Cardinals coffee mug tonight with uh, the Major League Baseball season opening tomorrow. So go Redbirds. Uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer at this time. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask God's blessing on our study tonight and ask him to bless our study of his word. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to once again come together and not only study this great book of Hebrews, but Father, to study the lesson tonight and glean the truths of your word. Father, we ask that you'll give your word free course in our hearts and our lives, and we pray that you'll just minister to us now. And Father, we ask that you'll anoint the message, anoint the teacher, and God, we pray that you'll bless everybody that is a part of this online study. And we ask these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Well, if you do have your Bibles, I would invite you to join with me and go to the book of Hebrews chapter number 11. And by way of introduction, the uh, this chapter introduces the final section of the epistle uh, of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, 12, and 13. And this could be called uh, a superior principle, which is faith. Uh, you know, the fact that Christ is uh, a superior person, which we talked about in Hebrews 1 through 6, and that he exercises a superior priesthood, which we talked about in Hebrews 7 and 10, uh, should encourage us to put our trust in him. And the readers of this epistle that received this letter uh, were being tempted to go back into Judaism. We've talked about that in previous lessons. And put their faith back in the law of Moses and back in the Levitical practices. Uh, their confidence was in the visible things, the tangible things of this world, not on the invisible realities and the intangible uh, truths of God's word. And instead of going on to perfection, which in this case would be striving for maturity, uh, they were going back to perdition or back to this wasteful way of life, which we talked about in Hebrews chapter 10 last week. In Hebrews chapter 11, which is what we're going to focus on tonight, all Christians are called to live by faith. And in it, the writer of Hebrews discussed two important topics relating to faith. So let's look at point number one, and that is the description of faith the description of faith. So let's go to Hebrews 11. We're going to read verses 1, 2, and 3. And these are well-known uh, scriptures in the Bible to most Christians that study the Word or that are students of the Word. And it says these words written here in Hebrews 11. Let's begin at verse 1. We'll read all the way down to verse number 3. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So this is not a definition of faith, so to speak, but a description of what faith does and how it works. True biblical faith is not blind optimism or a manufactured hope so feeling. Neither is it an intellectual approval to a doctrine. It is certainly not believing in spite of evidence. That would be superstition. True Bible faith 
is confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances and consequences. That's what it is. True Bible faith is a confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances and consequences. So when you look at that and you hear what I just said, this faith operates quite simply. God speaks and we hear his word. We trust his word and we act on it no matter what the circumstances are or no matter what the consequences may be. Uh, the circumstances may be impossible. They may look impossible. They may seem impossible. And the consequences may be frightening or even unknown to us. But we obey God's word just the same and believe him to do what is right in accordance to his will, which is always best. The unsaved world, the secular world, People that do not know Christ do not understand what true biblical faith is. Probably because the world seems to uh, possess so little faith, and they also see a lack of faith in the church today for that matter. The world fails to realize that faith is only as good as its objective. And the objective of our faith is God. Faith is not some feeling that we manufacture. It is our total response to what God has revealed in his word. And, and three words there in Hebrews 11, verses 1, 2, and 3, summarize what true Bible faith is. Substance, evidence, and witness. Those three words. The word translated substance, which says faith is a substance of things hoped for, literally means to stand under, to support. So faith is to a Christian what a foundation is to a house. It gives confidence and assurance that it's going to stand. So you might say faith is the confidence in the th of things hoped for, and that's really what it is. Faith is the confidence of the things hoped for. It is a trust in, in what God's going to do. And I think that's where we miss it sometimes. I think that's where we lack it sometimes. And when a believer has faith, um, it is God's way of giving us confidence and assurance that what is promised will be experienced. And the word evidence, of course, uh, says there in the scriptures, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so the evidence there really means conviction. Conviction. This is an inward conviction that uh, comes from God, and it believes that what God has promised, he's going to perform. Uh, the presence of God-given faith in our hearts is conviction enough that he will keep his word. And then we have the word witness, uh, which tells us in the scriptures uh, about how the elders obtained a good report. And it's important, that word in Hebrews 11, because it occurs not only in verse 2, but twice in verse 4, and once in verse 5, and once in verse 39. So, so you see that... Faith also uh, speaks there of the witness of faith. And, and really, the writer of Hebrews makes it clear that faith is a very practical thing. And in spite of what unbelievers say, faith enables us to understand what God does. Faith enables us to see what others cannot see. And as a result, faith enables us to do what others cannot do. And that in itself is the witness that we speak about, where it talks about where by it the elders obtain uh, a good report. There is a witness that follows our faith. There is a, a, a witness to our faith, so to speak. You look at the Old Testament saints of old, and you look at the patriarchs of old, and you can see the witness to their faith, whether it is uh, Noah, Moses, Abraham, uh, whomever you want to list in the in the great patriarchs of faith in this 11th chapter of Hebrews, they all, they all 
obtained a good report, which shows you that there was witness to their faith. And so that's important that we understand uh, that faith, as Dr. J. Oswald Sanders says, faith enables the believing soul to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. You know, it is, it is believing, it is trusting, it is having confidence in what God has said and believing that God will do it. Uh, it is not living in denial. It is not being superstitious. It is not uh, some sort of hope so mentality, as I said a moment ago. Uh, you know, when when God sent Abraham into the land of, of Moriah and said there uh, at the mountaintop where I'll show you there, offer your son Isaac as a burnt sacrifice unto me. God was telling him, you go to Moriah, kill your son and sacrifice him. That was his only son. And Isaac would be the heir, and out of Isaac would all the nations of the world be blessed through the, through the generations and descendants of Abraham. God promised him that. Now that he has a son, God tells him, go to the land of Moriah, and there offer him as a burnt sacrifice. And the whole time that they are walking up the mountain, and they are making their way to the top of the mountain in the land of Moriah, Isaac is saying, Father, we have the knife, we have the wood, we have the fire. But where's the lamb? You know, Isaac knew what sacrifice was. He recognized what his father was doing, but they were missing the lamb. And the entire time they're walking up that mountain, Abraham kept saying to him, the Lord will provide himself a lamb. Abraham had faith to follow through to the very end. His faith gives witness to the fact that even in the final analysis, he's on top of the mountain there in the land of Moriah, his son is bound and laid upon the altar. He has the knife in his hand and he is ready to kill his own son. When the angel of the Lord stops him and says, do not lay your hand on the lad. For God sees that you will not spare anything from him, even your only son. And of course, later they found the ram that was caught in the thicket. God provided a ram to be caught in the thicket and they were able to offer the ram as a sacrifice. Sometimes we don't understand sometimes what God is doing, but faith allows us to trust in him even when we don't see it. So we see the description of faith. So let's go on to point number two here, and let's look at the demonstration of faith. And this second point is going to be extended out tonight, and we're going to be reading starting at verse 4, reading all the way through to the end of the chapter to verse 40, but we're going to break it down into chunks and look at scriptures as we move along. So let's look at the demonstration of faith here. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 4 through 40, and we have, we have historical demonstrations or illustrations of faith and how it works. So let's look first at Abel, which was faith worshiping. And that's found in verse number four. Let's read in Hebrews 11 and four, it says, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. The background story is in Genesis 4, 1 through 10. Abel was a righteous man because of faith. And that's found in Matthew 23, 35. God had revealed to Adam and his descendants the true way of worship, and Abel obeyed God by faith. In fact, his obedience cost him his life. Cain was not a child of God, as 1 John 3 and 12 describes, because he did not have faith. He was religious, but not righteous. Abel speaks to us today as the very first martyr of the faith. And we see that there. The second example we have here is Enoch, which is faith walking. Let's look at verse 5 and verse 6 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And it goes on in verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. 
For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Our faith in God grows as we fellowship with God. And we must have both the desire to please him and the diligence to seek him. Prayer, uh, study and meditation on the word of God, worship, discipline, all of these uh, that we practice in our daily life help us in our walk with, with God. Enoch walked with God um, in the wicked world that he lived in, and, and this was before the flood came. He was able to keep his life pure, and one day Enoch was taken to heaven or translated, carried across is how that is, is, is um, described and how it's defined, and seen no more. Now, Abel died a violent death, but Enoch never died. God has a different plan for each one who trusts him. Some see in the translation of Enoch a picture of the rapture of the church when Jesus Christ returns, and that is very, very true. Now, Enoch is uh, based on the on the writings and the teachings of many commentators and uh, Bible scholars, and I fall into this school of thought as well in agreement. Enoch will be one of the two witnesses that re that are on the earth during the time of the tribulation, and I've shared that in our in our series. Are we living in the last days? Talking about uh, the two witnesses, Enoch and Elijah, are the only two uh, figures in Bible history that have never tasted of death. Both were caught up and taken away, and uh, never tasted of death. So it stands to reason, and it is a very plausible assumption that Enoch and Elijah will be the two witnesses that are on the earth during the time of the tribulation. And uh, we are quickly approaching that time as well. So we see here uh, this great faith in walking. The next example that's demonstrated is Noah, which is faith working. And in Hebrews 11 and 7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen, not, not seen as yet, Moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah's faith involved the whole person. His mind was warned of God, his heart was moved with fear, and his will acted on what God told him. Since nobody at that time had ever seen a flood or perhaps even a rainstorm, Noah's actions must have generated a great deal of interest along with a lot of ridicule and backlash. Noah's faith influenced his whole family, and they were saved. It also condemned the rest of the world because his faith also revealed their unbelief. And, of course, the events of the Bible prove that Noah was right because um, he did spare his family when God sent a flood upon the earth and judged mankind. And Jesus used this experience to warn people to be ready for his return. In Matthew 24, verses 36 to 42, when he says, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So the, in Noah's days, we see where people were involved in innocent everyday activities, and they completely ignored the warnings, the proclamation, and uh, the witness that Noah gave to them. And when Noah and his wife and his three sons and his daughters-in-law went into the ark, God shut the door. There was, a, there was a space and a time for people to not only uh, get on, on board the ark, but save their life. And they chose to ignore him. So we see there where we have these examples of Abel, who demonstrates faith in worshiping, Enoch, who demonstrates faith in walking with God, and Noah, who demonstrates faith in working for God. Now we look at the patriarchs of old, which is faith in waiting uh, on God. So let's look at verses uh, 8 through 22. Now we've got a lot of ground here to cover, so we'll try to try to get through that and read it all if we can. So let's go ahead and read. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. 
By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came, from whence they came, I like that, from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that an Isaac shall thy seed be called. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was a dying blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. I like that. I like that. The emphasis on this section here is on the promise of God and his plans for the nation of Israel. The nation began with the call of Abraham. God promised Abraham and Sarah a son, but they had to wait 25 years for the fulfillment of the promise. Their son Isaac then became the father of Jacob and Esau, and it was in Jacob that the nation really grew through the birth of his 12 sons, which later would represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And you notice in the scripture that that. They all had demonstrated true faith. They all were waiting on the promise of God. They all had faith in what God said, and they all died in faith. They all died in faith waiting for the promise. That promise, of course, was the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. They were a great nation. God had established a great nation for them. Of course, as I always say, God uh, established a covenant with Abraham, established a nation with Abraham. And of course, uh, he was able to expand it through Isaac and through Jacob. He preserved it um, through the, uh, the life of Joseph. He delivered it by the hand and by the power and work of Moses. And then, of course, he established it uh, through the kings and the patriarchs and spoke to it by the prophets. And ultimately, he, he, he sent his son to be their Messiah. Jesus died for the sins of mankind, but all of the things in God's covenant pointed to Christ. But these patriarchs, they waited for this promise. And you notice it says in the scriptures, by faith, Abraham obeyed. Uh, he obeyed, even though he didn't know where he was going. Abraham's whole life was a demonstration of obedience to God. And that's what faith does. Faith obeys. Faith obeys. And faith, and faith will believe. And Ab Abraham believed God. And he trusted in God and he believed in God. And that's so important because these patriarchs of old, they obviously understood the covenant of God and they obeyed God. They sometimes didn't always understand what God was doing, how God was working, how God was going to move and minister and intercede in situations. But they did have the, uh, the great, great faith 
that they could trust and they could wait on God. That's the hard thing. Faith doesn't always, um, you know, faith doesn't always show up uh, sometimes in the difficult, uh, you know, when everything's going well. Faith a lot of times will show up when we're having to wait on God, when we're having to be patient, when we're having to go through struggles. That's when faith really arises in our soul. That's what happened here in these Old Testament patriarchs uh, with Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, and later Joseph. So let's move on now to Moses, uh, who is another demonstration here of, of faith warring or faith uh, that fights. And let's go to verse 23 and read all the way down to verse number 29. And of course, this is speaking here of Moses. And it says in the scriptures, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover, and sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, as saying to do, were drowned. So Moses was fortunate to have believing parents, and, and for them to hide their son from the authorities was certainly an act of faith. You read in Exodus 2, 1 through 10, every child, every male child uh, was killed because the Hebrews grew so numerous that the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh feared that they would someday overthrow him or overtake him. So he had an order that uh, all the male babies were to be killed, to be drowned. And, um, and we see here amidst all of this, um, where Moses survives this carnage. And um, Moses' parents, who were named Amram and Yohebed, uh, though godly parents, you know, they hid him. They did the only thing they could do, and they did that by faith. And, you know, it's important to remember that godly parents, um, you know, while we can't pass on our faith as we do other family traits, we can certainly create an atmosphere of faith in our home and give examples to children. And a home should be really the first place where children and young people see faith in action. Uh, and three great themes relating to faith are seen here in the life of Moses. And he gives us an illustration. And we see in Amram and Yohebed how uh, how they 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 showed their son and their children uh, what faith was because you know Abraham or uh, Abraham you know did things through faith and that faith led to the birth of the nation of Israel and that nation of Israel was full of people like Amram and Yohebed that exhibited faith that affected their children Moses saw that and three things that you see here is first of all the refusal by faith. You look at verses 24 and 25, you know, Moses was found in, is, was found in, the, in the river by Pharaoh's daughter and was raised in the house of Pharaoh. And uh, so he was the adopted son of an Egyptian princess. And Moses could have stayed right there in the palace, led a very easy life, uh, and could have enjoyed all the luxury of, of royalty. But instead, his faith moved him to refuse that kind of a life. And he rather identified with God's people and endured the suffering that they suffered. True faith will cause a believer to hold to the right values and make the right choices and the right decisions. The phrase pleasures of sin does not refer only to the lust and other gross sins. That phrase describes a way of life that, that people today uh, try to attain in this life. 
position, prestige, power, wealth, freedom from problems. People want success. And, and while sin has a high price, a lot of times people will, will pursue personal things instead of spiritual things. Moses chose to identify with God's people rather than enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. And Moses' refusal by faith led to a reproach because of his faith. You know, Moses left the palace. He never went back. And so he identifies now as a Jew and says, I'm a Jew. He knew he was a Hebrew. He knew he was a Jew. How do you say that, Pastor Scouts? Because the Bible tells us that, you know, whenever Miriam, his sister, saw that <clears throat> Moses was, was found by the daughter of Pharaoh, she ran to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's daughter and said, shall I catch, shall I fetch uh, a, a handmaid to nurse this child? And she said, yes, yes, please do. And the woman that she found, the woman that she, she sought was her mother. So here's what happened. Amram and Yohebed placed their little baby, Moses, in a little, in a little basket ark, and they put it in the water and they they let him float down the water and he and he stopped at the place where the daughter of Pharaoh was bathing herself and she saw him and had compassion and wanted to raise the child and Miriam followed him to make sure he stayed safe Miriam followed behind at a distance and then comes to the daughter of Pharaoh and says shall i find a Hebrew handmaiden to nurse it. And she said yes, and she went and got her mother. And so until Moses was weaned and stopped nursing, he was in the arms of his mother every single day. And I'm quite sure that as Johebed was nursing him, as Johebed was caring for him, she was telling Moses, whispering to him, telling him, you're not, you're not Egyptian. You are a Hebrew. You're my son. You are a Hebrew. You are a child of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You are a Hebrew. I'm quite sure that, <laughs> that Abraham knew where he came from. He knew who he was. He knew what his family lineage was. But yet he lived in the house of Pharaoh and was the stepson to Pharaoh's daughter. But he refused at some point to no longer call himself an Egyptian or a prince in Egypt. And he suffered for that. He suffered for that. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, you know, it's important to realize that, you know, sometimes uh, we don't want to always bear the reproach and the suffering that comes with being a Christian and having faith, but that's what faith does. Faith allows us, uh, you know, to live by faith and walk in faith. Also, there was the reward of faith because we read here, uh, you know, that God rewarded Moses' faith. He ultimately, ultimately, Moses saw the recompense of the reward, as the Bible says. Dr. Vance Havner, great preacher, once was quoted as saying, Moses chose the imperishable, saw the invisible, and did the impossible. Moses' faith enabled him to face Pharaoh unafraid, to trust God to deal with his enemies. And the endurance of Moses was not a natural gift, because for by nature, you know, Moses was, was hesitant and retired. This endurance and courage came as a reward of his faith. And the faith that Moses had was rewarded with the deliverance for he and all of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. And that's so beautiful. Faith brings us out. Faith brings us out. And faith did that for Moses. We also see here in verse 30 and 31, the faith of Joshua and Rahab, which is a faith that wins. In Hebrews 11, 30 and 31, it says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down 
after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. So the, the, the account here of the conquest of Jericho is found in Joshua chapters 2 through 6. Joshua was the successor to Moses. He's now leading the children of Israel into the promised land of Canaan. And here they encounter uh, the walled city of Jericho. You know the story. They marched around. Uh, they marched around the um, the city of Jericho for seven days. And on the seventh day, they marched seven times, and then they shouted to the Lord. And uh, they shouted out to the Lord, and the walls came down. Well, they sent spies in to uh, to spy out to spy out the city of Jericho. And Rahab, who was a harlot, took them in and hid these men. And it's important because Rahab was delivered from the judgment and she was spared when the walls came down. She was spared in her family. And it's important to remember because Rahab was not a Jew. Rahab was not a Jew. But her first concern was to the saving of her family. Now, she did not have any idea uh, who God was. She had no idea about the teachings, uh, what God had spoken through the mouths of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. She had, she had no knowledge of that. All she knew was what she had heard. She had heard about the exploits of the, of the Israelites. She knew what their armies had done. She knew what their God was able to do. And she had faith. She had faith. She trusted. She trusted in God. And her first concern was to the saving of her family. And, and, and so she wanted to, you know, she wanted to save her family. And so she operated in great faith and demonstrated great faith. I mean, she stands as one of the great women of faith in the Bible. It's amazing that a harlot would be mentioned uh, as someone having great faith, but she did. And she saw that and heard that. And she believed. I think it comes back to, you know, the simple words that Jesus said in the scriptures, have faith in God. Rahab had that. She had no way of, of basing her trust on anything other than just what was in her heart and what she knew. Um, you talk about a childlike, simple faith. This harlot Rahab had that. Uh, it's amazing. She had that childlike faith and believed, well, God's going to spare his people and he's going to defeat the people of Jericho. I want me and my house to be spared. And she asked these spies to help her. She asked these spies to save her. And praise God, he did spare her and her family when the walls came down. What an incredible story of faith. And then we see in the last nine verses of Scripture, verses 32 through 40, the various heroes of faith. And it reads, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, Stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. <laughs> they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. 
Now, faith can operate in the life of any person who will dare to listen to God's word and surrender to God's will. And what a variety of characters we have here. Gideon was a frightened farmer whose faith grew so strong that he was able to uh, see great victory. Uh, Barak won a resounding victory over Sisera, but he needed Deborah the prophetess as his helper to assure him. Both Gideon and Barak are encouragements to us who sometimes falter in our faith. The story of Samson is also similar. You know, you would not um, you would not think of Samson as a godly man um, because he yielded to his fleshly carnal appetites, and you know he was a Nazarite, which means he was dedicated to God, was never allowed to cut his hair, and uh, and partake of the fruit of the vine. Samson failed miserably, but he did trust God to help and deliver him. And in the end, Samson was willing to give his own life to defeat the army of the Philistines. And, and you know, I just want to say that, that Samson is an illustration to us and an example that we cannot live double lives. You can't live double lives and still enjoy God's blessings. You just can't do that. You can't you can't be one way on Sunday and then live another way on Monday through Saturday. It just doesn't work. God sees it, and God knows what you're doing, and you're not fooling God. And eventually, we'll have to answer for that. Jephthah's story is fascinating uh, because he it's, it's unlikely that he sacrificed his only daughter as a burnt offering. He said that he would, but instead, he, he gave his daughter... Um, to the Lord. He dedicated her to the Lord. And uh, it's not possible for us to examine, you know, all of these uh, examples of faith. And even the, he even the writer of Hebrews has to stop after he mentions David and Samuel. These were great men of faith. But all of these great people in the Old Testament and all these patriarchs of faith uh, demonstrated that element of faith. Daniel had great faith. And even when he was in the, the lion's den, God spared him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were spared because of their great faith. The prophets of old raised the dead, uh, you know, called down fire from heaven. They did things by faith. And it's so important that we understand that these heroes of faith, you know, they struggled. They had issues like everyone else on this earth faces. The Christian life is not for the faint of heart. It's not for those that, um, that, 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 you know, <laughs> that are weak, especially in 2022. Um, you know, the Lord Jesus said, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find such faith on the earth? Speaking of when he returns, is he going to find a church full of faith or is he going to find Christian believers and people that are faltering and that are failing? I contend that the reason the church has been so weakened and so lackluster uh, in its mission on this earth over the last century uh, is because we're lacking faith. The one thing the church needs more than ever is faith in God. We must have that faith in God. So as we conclude tonight, remember the words written in Hebrews 11 and 6 that say, without faith, it is impossible to please God. We must remember that this kind of faith grows as we listen to his word and fellowship and worship and prayer. Faith is impossible uh, to deny. We, we, you, you, can't, you can spot it in the life of believers when they're exercising it. But faith is possible to all kinds of believers in all kinds of situations. And it's not just for a select few, it's for everyone. We all have a measure of faith. And like I said, it's impossible to miss when faith is in action and when faith is being demonstrated. Just look at, just look at the life of, of, of Noah. Look at the life of Daniel. Look at the life of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was impossible to deny their faith. When they said, we will not bow, our God is able to deliver us from the flames of the fiery furnace. But even if he doesn't, we still will not bow. 
those around these three Hebrews are seeing their faith in action. It's impossible to deny what you're seeing. Well, because it was possible for those three Hebrews to have faith in the first place. So let's have faith and pray for God to increase our faith. And that's our lesson for tonight. So bow your heads with me as we close in prayer tonight. And let's ask God to bless us as we bring our study to a close. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this great study tonight on a great topic of faith. Father, we pray that you will help us as we go through the rest of this week to not only understand the importance of faith, but Lord, that we can walk by faith and not by sight. Lord, we thank you that we all have a measure of faith. And as we concluded with the statement in our lesson tonight, Lord, increase our faith. Give us a greater faith and a greater awareness of your word and the truth of your word. And Father, bless us the rest of this week. Prosper us and keep us in health, even as our soul prospers. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you all. and Thank you so much for uh, being with us. Uh, this evening, I invite you to join us for our upcoming Palm Sunday service. We'll be both available online as well as in person. And be sure to join us next week as we continue with our lesson series here from the book of Hebrews as we're winding it down, uh, coming to the conclusion of this great study in the book of Hebrews. And we've enjoyed bringing the lessons to you every week. So from all of us here at Lebanon Rock Church, I pray that you have a wonderful week. God bless you. And we look forward to having you with us again next time.